We all say things we regret in the heat of emotion. Things we wish we could take back, and nothing creates such high emotion as protecting the ones we love. When a loved one is vulnerable and being attacked, our sense of self-preservation may likely go right out the window. For Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, when he bore witness to the fight, 11-year-old David Glatzel, the little brother of his fiance, was fighting, it seemed as though Arnie's self-preservation was long gone. It was a fight the likes of which he'd never seen before, one that would terrify most. But this wasn't the kind of fight that he could step in the middle of, or pull the aggressor off and hold them back. No, this fight was different. David thrashed, growled, spit. His eyes rolled back until only the whites of his eyes were visible. He cursed and spoke in strange tongues, his once youthful voice now lost amongst what sounded like multiple voices, all expelling from his throat at once. David was undergoing an exorcism, and Arnie only knew of one way he could have possibly been of some use. Arnie shouted out abruptly, furiously, at whatever twisted thing had control over David. He challenged it to leave David alone, and instead to fight with him, to take him on. No one there knew what was to come as a result of this, as the unseen forces locked their focus on Arnie. With his taunt, Arnie would get precisely what he asked for, without knowing what price would come to be paid, with fatal consequences. In this episode of Seriously Strange, we delve into the possession of Arnie Johnson. This episode is brought to you by Hempire Bro, a free-to-play mobile game all about growing the devil's lettuce, or as you might know it, weed. In this dank-ass game, you get to build your own marijuana enterprise and become the greatest of all hemperers to ever exist. The link to get Hempire is in the description below, so give it a quickie clicky and get that sticky icky. In Hempire, you get to grow your grass, sell that skunk, and become the boss of the bud deal with a number of unique but um, oddly familiar characters and compete against your friends while you blaze your way to the top of the leaderboards. One of the dankest aspects of Hempire is that you can breed strains to create new strains like Jack Herrera and Northern Lights. Ah, Northern Lights. I'd love a couple of bones of that happy cabbage. Oh, ha ha ha. Mmm, tasty buds. And the strains yeah. just keep getting more and more choice. You can start to make brownies, oils, and more, and soon you'll be swimming in fat stacks of that frog skin, yeah. bruh. So partner up with some sick grass monkeys and reefer rats, keep your equipment up and running, invest in your city, and become king of the kush by hitting up the link in the description below now and downloading Hempire. When you support my sponsors, you show them that they should come back for more business. And that makes you one kind bud. Thanks for listening. Arnie Johnson was engaged to Debbie Glatzel. So when the Glatzel family acquired a new rental property, Arnie came with them to help clean it out. When they found the small yellow house back in the woods near Brookfield, Connecticut, Debbie declared it was her little dream house. A waterbed had been abandoned in the master bedroom by previous tenants, and each person took turns lying on the bed and laughing. Everyone except for David Glatzel, Debbie's 11-year-old brother. But later that day, while alone in the room, he felt as if something had pushed him onto the bed. While he laid on the gently waving surface, confused by what he had felt, he saw an old man in a torn plaid shirt and blue jeans. The stranger then told him to beware. Frightened by the man, David went to his family, 
but they thought he was just trying to get out of helping with the cleaning. Later that day, David saw the old man again, but this time his skin was black as though it had been burned. His eyes were dark pits. He appeared no longer to be just a man, but more, like he was fused with a wild animal. The beastly man would at random moments mutter in Latin, and eventually he threatened to steal David's soul. This would mark the beginning of the terrible events that afflicted the family. From that point onward, David would begin exhibiting strange behavior. He would hiss and growl at his family, or speak in otherworldly voices. Frequently, David would recite passages from the Bible. He would also quote an epic poem by John Milton called Paradise Lost, which his family firmly claimed David had never read. With the subject matter being about the temptation of Adam and Eve by Satan and their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, combined with David's changes in behavior, the Glatzels quickly believed David to be possessed. As time went by, he was unable to sleep. David writhed in his bed, shouting obscenities. He pulled at invisible hands that appeared to be choking him and flinched in pain at non-existent knife wounds. While his family watched, marks and bruises would appear on David's body from the unseen assaults. When David's visions persisted, Debbie asked Arnie to move into the Glatzel home. The family would take to sleeping during the day, preparing to hold down David at night. At times, he gained unnatural strength and could push off five grown adults during one of his fits. They listened to the young boy recount his visions of the beast and the evil things he would say. At their wit's end, the Glatzel family called on their church for guidance. A priest from St. Joseph's Catholic Church came to the Glatzel home. He attempted to bless the house, but by all appearances, just made things worse. David began seeing the old man in a flannel shirt while awake during the day. With nowhere else to turn, the famed demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren were called. Opinions on the Warrens were mixed, some thinking them as charlatans lying for media fame. Others swore by their help, and time has not changed this divide. When Lorraine first encountered David, she claimed to see a black mist form next to him. It was clear to them that something evil was tormenting the child. The Warrens also brought along a doctor, wanting to dispel any chance that the case was caused by mental illness. David was found to have a minimal learning disability, but otherwise was termed as being a typical young boy. The Warrens visited the family regularly over a few months. During that time, David had gained 60 pounds and continued to growl at his family members, even attacking his mother and grabbing her chest. He also attacked his grandmother with a knife. Every night, a family member would remain awake to monitor David, as he would jerk into 30-minute frenzies of rapid sit-ups. During waking hours, he made numerous references to murder and stabbings. The Warrens felt they were sitting on a powder keg. Lorraine even called the Brookfield police and warned them that there was a possibility of danger in the Glatzel household. The Warrens said there were warning signs when the beast was about to take possession of David. His head would lower to his chest, and then as he slowly lifts it, his features would become contorted into a snarl, and there was nothing to be seen but the whites of his eyes. And then he would laugh a hideous laugh. David's behavior was not the only sign of evil within the home. The family said they saw a toy dinosaur belonging to one of the Glatzel boys walking around of its own accord. 
They saw plates that levitated, rocking chairs that had flown through the air, and books began moving mysteriously. A cake pan floated straight to the ceiling during one incident and left a mess on the kitchen ceiling. The family claimed the beast had called up David's brother on the telephone and warned him to beware. Debbie said she had been clawed by a mysterious green hand rising from the floor that attacked her in her bed at night. Three lesser exorcisms were performed on David during this time, the first taking place at St. Joseph's with four priests in attendance. During one of these exorcisms, they demanded to know the demon's name who afflicted the boy. David gave them the names of 43 entities. It was while bearing witness to one of the exorcisms that Arnie Johnson made an error to taunt whatever it was inside of David. And soon after, this action would have deadly consequences. The stress of David's possession began to weigh on his family members. The house had become so unbearable that Debbie and Arnie moved out. She was hired by a man named Alan Bono to work as a dog groomer at the Brookfield Pet Motel. Bono offered them the adjacent apartment, and Alan became their landlord. However, Arnie had changed. He had been known to the community as an upstanding young man, he sang in the church choir, and one Christmas, he used his earnings to buy his mother an old car so she didn't need to walk to work. Even the Warrens are quoted as calling Arnie the type of son you wished you would have. Since leaving the Glatzel home, he grew distant, slipping into a trance. He would growl and say that he saw the beast. Later, he would have no memory of it. A few days later, Arnie got into a car accident in which he claimed the demon had tried to possess him. Shortly after, he returned to the Glatzel home and went to the old well where the devil reportedly lived. Despite Ed and Lorraine's warnings not to confront the beast, he locked eyes with the demon in the well, and allegedly it possessed him completely. He began howling at nothing. He became aggressive and hallucinated, horrifying scenarios in which he was covered in blood. The events that followed, Arnie supposedly had no memory of. During one of the occasions where Arnie called in sick, he went to see Debbie at the dog groomers, along with his sister Wanda and his nine-year-old cousin Mary. Alan Bono took the four of them out to lunch, during which time Bono drank excessively. They returned to Bono's apartment, where he became agitated with Debbie and her growing desire to leave after an invitation to stay for dinner. Bono grabbed young Mary by the hand and wouldn't let her go. According to Wanda, who tried to separate the two men, Arnie became like a beast, growling and hissing at Bono before pulling out a pocket knife. Debbie claimed to hear Arnie speaking in two voices simultaneously. Arnie then stabbed Bono over 20 times, deep in the chest and slicing into him from gut to heart. Arnie walked into the woods when it was over, staring straight ahead and leaving the women behind with Bono, who was bleeding heavily. It was as if he didn't care that Bono had become agitated and wouldn't let go of Mary, as if his attack wasn't meant to protect Mary, but more to kill Bono. Despite the vicious attack, Bono managed to keep to his feet and just stood there, punching his fist into his palm. He did this for a few moments, blood pooling on the floor at his feet before he finally collapsed forward and hit the ground. 
Debbie chased after Arnie, leaving Wanda and Mary with Alan Bono as his life was slipping away. Also left behind was the knife that, according to them, maintained an unnatural glow after Arnie had left. He was discovered two miles from the site of the murder. Arnie was soon arrested and was held at the Bridgeport Correctional Center on bail of $125,000. This was the first murder in the history of Brookfield, Connecticut. The day after the murder, Lorraine Warren informed the Brookfield police that Arnie was possessed when the crime was committed. Thus, the media circus began. A media blitz soon surrounded the story, fueled in part by the Warrens, whose agents promised that lectures, a book, and even a movie detailing the gruesome case were in the works. Martin Manella, Arnie's lawyer, received calls from worldwide about what was being called the Demon Murder Trial. Manella was adamant about his client's plea. He traveled to England to confer with lawyers who had handled two possession defenses in the past and said he would fly in exorcism specialists from Europe. He threatened to subpoena the priests involved if they didn't come forward to testify. I'm going to show the guy isn't insane and that it's not a delusion, he said. The courts have dealt with the existence of God and now they'll be asked to deal with the existence of the demonic spirit. This wouldn't be the case, because Manella attempted to submit a plea of not guilty by virtue of possession. The presiding judge, Robert Callahan, promptly rejected this defense. Callahan argued that no such protection could ever exist in a court of law due to lack of evidence. It would be irrelative and unscientific to allow related testimony. The defense then decided to enter a plea of self-defense, implying that Arnie had been worried for the safety of his nine-year-old cousin. Due to this, the jury was not legally allowed to consider demonic possession as a viable explanation for the murder. The jury deliberated for 15 hours over three days before convicting Arnie Johnson on November 24, 1981 of first-degree manslaughter. He was subsequently sentenced to 10 to 20 years, but got out after five due to good behavior. In the time since the murder, controversy had stirred when part of the family went against the Warrens, saying they exploited their brother's mental illness for money. Debbie and Arnie, however, have since gotten married and remain firm in the fact that demons truly had taken control to spill the blood of Alan Bono that day. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to check out our sponsor, Hempire, because when enough of you use my sponsors, they come back to sponsor more content, and that means more content for you. Thanks to all those who do. And be sure to subscribe to my channel now, because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.